Coming up on today's episode of Airborne. Spaceship 2 crash investigation is underway. The Santa Monica Airport benefits from aero industry contributions. And Quicksilver is to deliver a Sport 2 SE to a special customer. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. Acting NTSB Chairman Christopher Hart held several media briefings over the weekend and indicated that the investigation process is well underway into the loss of Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2. And while it's way too early to name a specific probable cause for the accident that befell Spaceship 2, evidence has revealed a series of worrisome clues that seem to indicate that Spaceship 2 may have undergone an uncommanded wing feathering sequence at a speed in excess of Mach 1. Wing feathering requires two primary actions. The first is to activate the wing feathering system, usually done at 1.4 Mach, and this time done a bit earlier at about 1.0. The other is to actuate the wing feather sequence itself, which was reportedly not commanded or actuated, but occurred anyway. The ramifications of an uncommanded feathering system actuation at such speeds are significant and sure to be a major target of the NTSB investigative process. The spaceship was released normally and after it was released, shortly after it was released, the rocket engine ignited. About nine seconds after the engine ignited, the telemetry data told us, showed us that the feather parameters changed from lock to unlock. Now, in order for feathering this action to be commanded by the pilots, two actions must occur. One is the lock-unlock handle must be moved from lock to unlock. And number two is the feathering handle must be moved to the feather position. Approximately two seconds after the feathering parameters indicated that the lock-unlock lever was moved from lock to unlock, the feathers moved toward the extended position, the deployed position, even though the feather handle itself had not been moved. And this occurred at a speed just above approximately Mach 1.0. Shortly after the feathering occurred, the telemetry data terminated and the video data terminated. The engine burn was normal up until the extension of the feathers. There is a camera in the cockpit. There are several cameras in the, in the space vehicle. There's a camera in the cockpit mounted on the ceiling that looks forward and shows the actions of the pilots and the instruments. And review of that camera is consistent with the telemetry data and shows that the feather lock-unlock lever was moved by the co-pilot from the lock position to the unlock position. Normal launch procedures are that after the, the release, the ignition of the rocket and acceleration, that the, feather, the, the feathering devices are not to be moved. The unlock, the lock-unlock lever is not to be moved into the unlock position until the acceleration up to Mach 1.4. Instead, as I indicated, that occurred approximately Mach 1.0. Hart announced that the parties who will participate in the investigation are the FAA, Scaled Composites, and Virgin Galactic. He said the initial collaboration with these parties has gone very well. The investigation process has been divided into six key areas. These areas are documentation of the wreckage, vehicle systems, engines, vehicle performance, data, and operations. The FBI is leading the documentation of the wreckage, which is spread along a path of about five miles. Hart said wreckage like this is an indication of an in-flight breakup. Hart said the systems and data group are working together and they have extensive data to work from. Spaceship 2 had six cameras and the White Knight 2 launch vehicle had three cameras. Telemetry monitored over 1,000 parameters and a range camera located at Edwards Air Force Base had visual contact with the spaceship. 
The chase plane was also recording with cameras. Hart reported that people in the operations area are being interviewed, but said those interviews would not be released because they could have an impact on further interviews. He said that the surviving pilot had not yet been interviewed due to medical and family considerations. The engine group has started their investigation. However, the wreckage was spread out such that fuel tanks were located some distance from the engine itself. Hart reports the NTSB has found propellant and oxidizer tanks as well as the engine core, and that none of those systems appear to have suffered from a burn through. Hart expects the on-site investigation to take about a week, and a final report on this accident is estimated to take about 12 months. The MBAA and the AOPA have contributed at least $540,000 to help support a bailout initiative in Santa Monica, California that would preserve Santa Monica Municipal Airport. It's reported that about $824,000 have been contributed to the Measure D campaign from aircraft owners, pilots, and businesses. Disclosure forms show that actor Harrison Ford, who keeps his airplane at the airport, has given nearly $26,000 to the effort. It's reported that supporters opposing Measure D have raised $118,400 as of the last reporting period. They say that Measure D is a cynical attempt to fool voters into giving up access to the airport land. And so the battle for Santa Monica Airport continues. After these messages, a Quicksilver sport plane will be delivered to a special person. ADS-B will be mandatory for most aircraft by 2020 in the United States, but you can benefit from ADS-B today with the Bendix King KT-74 Mode S Transponder. The KT-74 meets the global mandates for ADS-B out when attached to a suitable WASP GPS. Over the past two decades, no resource has compiled as much expert valued information about the sport plane world than the Sport Plane Resource Guide. Over 1,500 pages, hundreds of aircraft, dozens of how-tos and directories. All this and more will be coming to the sport aviation world soon with the new all-electronic and updatable Sport Plane Resource Guide for your iPad, iPhone, Kindle, tablet, PC, or other electronic devices. Get your order in now www.sportplane.com. Welcome back. If you have a story suggestion for Airborne, Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. Quicksilver Aeronautics President and CEO Willis Kucha says they'll be delivering a light sport version of their Sport 2SE to Jimmy Aguilar, who is a very special customer. Aguilar is a former paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne Division and a first Gulf War veteran. After his time in active duty, he returned home to Puerto Rico. However, following the 9-11 attacks, he re-enlisted and by 2006 was fighting in Iraq. After being wounded in combat three times, he returned to the United States and retired in 2009. Aguilar has suffered greatly and said he needed to feel whole again, so he pursued his dream of flying. This led to him receiving a sport pilot's license and experiencing the Quicksilver. Aguilar said that unlike the other airplanes, the open cockpit made him feel like he was free. He said, quote, I could feel the wind, smell the ocean, and see dew in the fields on early morning flights. It's helped me a lot, giving me the encouragement to continue thriving for a better future, end quote. He also added, quote, I'm working on my Sport Pilot CFI rating, and I'll soon be a proud owner of a Quicksilver SLSA, in which I want to take up my brothers in arms so they too can benefit from the healing of the soul, as I like to call it, using the power of flight, end quote. We at Annan thank Jimmy for his service and look forward to hearing more about his mission in the Quicksilver. Each week, we share with you a sample of an online video one of our viewers found especially entertaining. We call it our Aero Video of the Week. The airplane has been designed to do something never before achieved. Within seven months, it will fly faster than the speed of sound. 
This week, our video presents an in-depth look at what it took to break the sound barrier. Search Frontiers of Flight 09 on YouTube. A P-40 Warhawk landing at New Smyrna Beach Airport on Florida's central Atlantic coast suffered a landing gear failure after touching down last week. It was reported that a New Smyrna Beach police spokesman said that the pilot of the aircraft was uninjured. It appears the airplane skidded off the runway, but did not flip over, and the pilot was uninjured. According to a local TV station report, the plane was present during the Japanese bombings of Pearl Harbor, but was not destroyed because it was in a hangar for repairs to its landing gear. After the break, the Aeromobile 3.0 makes its first public appearance. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird X-Wind SE and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulation.com. Welcome back. The Aeromobile 3.0 prototype of a rotable aircraft was shown publicly for the first time at the Vienna Pioneers Festival in Austria on Wednesday. The company flew the airplane in Slovakia, where it's being built, before taking it to the event. The specifications posted on the company's website indicate the vehicle's Rotax 912 engine gives the Aeromobile 3.0 a top speed in flight of over 108 knots and more than 100 miles per hour on the road. Takeoff speed is 78 knots and the range as an airplane is about 370 nautical miles. While the production prototype is flying, the aircraft car has a long way to go before it's available to the public. The rotable aircraft will be priced in the same realm as a supercar, which would likely put it north of $250,000. No production or delivery schedule has been released. The Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award is presented by the FAA safety team to pilots who have been certificated in flying for 50 consecutive years without an accident. On November 8th, FAA officials will be on hand at the regular monthly meeting of EAA Chapter 983, Granbury, Texas, to present 13 Chapter EAA 983 pilots with this prestigious award. It's thought to be the most recipients ever to be honored in one ceremony in Texas, and likely the entire country, according to Joe Murphy, local FAA safety team leader. Each honoree receives a certificate, lapel pin, and their names will be added to the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award Roll of Honor, which lists close to 3,000 master pilots. We at ANN join with EAA in congratulating the recipients of this award. Well, that's our program for Monday, November 3rd. Remember to get comprehensive real-time 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. Remember, Airborne is streamed three times a week and is always online. You can join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a new edition. And remember, the next generation of Airborne will be unveiled right after New Year's. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.